Well, I'm excited to be able to moderate today this is a conversation on how banks can better serve their communities. Uh, I think we have some very powerful people to be a part of this conversation. And I, what I most appreciate about them is they have very holistic analysis of what needs to change. Not so much as a focus on one or two practices, but a recognition of kind of the structures of banking and how those need to be uh, refocused in order to better deal with the issues of inequality we all, care, we all care so much about. So let me just do a brief uh, bio introduction of our two uh, speakers and then uh, we, will, we will take questions. We'll have a brief amount of time for questions. There should be some cards at the center of the table and people can uh, write down their questions as the conversation goes, raise their hand up and we have some runners who will pick up the questions and bring them to me. But uh, first, let me start off with Marissa Baradaran, who is an Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives at the University of Georgia Law School. Uh, her scholarship includes the books, How the Other Half Banks and the Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, both published by Harvard University Press. I heard a few applause, you know, I'm assuming it's for both books, because both books are very good. Uh, the, second one's which, the second one's better, she says? Okay, very good. <laughs> And actually, we'll have an opportunity to go more in depth about the second one in a panel following this on the Racial Wealth Divide panel. And then we also have a, a Kat Taylor, who is, an, who is active in a variety of social enterprises, public benefit, and philanthropic ventures on the West Coast. Currently, she serves as co-founder and co-CEO of Beneficial State Bank, a community development financial institution whose mission is to bring beneficial banking to low-income communities in an economically in an environmentally sustainable manner. So I'm going to throw the first question to uh, Marissa, and was wondering if you could start us off by highlighting some of your analysis from your book, How the Other Half Banks, and how financial institutions most often are not designed to help meet the needs of mid to lower income people. Sure, um, is my mic on? So, uh, you know, I talk in there about... Um, Can people hear? Yes. Okay. Is that on? Um, hello? Yes, now it's on? Yes, okay. Um, no, higher. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. Um, so, you know, in the book I talk about how, um, you know, the unbanked have to spend um, something like 10% of their income just to use their money. So just on financial transactions. If we're, gonna, if we're going to um, separate... Yes? Yeah, good. Okay. We're going to separate so the financial needs that people have, right, into financial transactions, so the using of money, paying bills, et cetera, and then credit. Those are the two things that banks do. Um, so if for the unbanked, those who um, don't have a bank account or aren't using their, their bank as their primary means of funding, they spend about 10% of their income just to use their money. Not only is that expensive, but it's also a huge hassle, right? Um, you have to go to the water office, to the cell phone office, to the electricity office to pay your your bill, you have to change cash into money orders, back to cash, etc. Um, then there's the credit side. And the credit side is, I think, um, more important because in this area, I link it up to um, the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve, most banks get cheap credit. At this point, the Federal Reserve is actually paying $800 million um, a year on bank reserves to the big banks. So JP Morgan gets something like $9 million a year just to hold their money at the Federal Reserve. That's just one thing, but there's all sorts of other credit programs that the big banks plug in to the Federal Reserve. The thing, the, uh, the, the point of that is that it's going to come out to the people, um, but it gets stuck in the banks because the banks get to choose their customers and they're always gonna choose more profitable customers. That's how sort of capitalism works, right? So, um, so the idea is you, you're, you're using banks as a middleman to provide these services, financial transactions and credit, but both of those are public services. Financial transactions all run through the public payment system, as you all know, and then credit you know, the source of most credit is the Federal Reserve. So why should banks be able to choose their customers and exclude um, a big portion of the population from that, who then have to go to the market and pay 300% um, on credit, uh, you know, payday lenders, and, you know, check cashing, something like 
um, for, for checks cashed. So in the book I propose, um, this was a while ago and it's gotten um, some traction, but I propose postal banking. Um, and postal banking is a really um, sort of historically grounded way of getting those basic services um, to uh, the public. And we did it in America from 1910 to 1966. And I tell that story. It was very efficient, very successful. Abroad, it is the primary means of banking for um, for financial inclusion. So, so that's the sort of thesis of the first book. And, and the importance of it is that you have um, public goods uh, that are not going to the uh, the public. Good, very good. And so, hold the mic. Um, and so, Kat, you were telling me, you hear me? We're good? No. Well, oh, wow, okay. We'll pass the mic then. So, Kat, uh, you were telling me that, um, that the book, How the Other Half Banks, had helped influence uh, the creation of Beneficial State Bank. And was wondering if you could talk about, you know, because I think, you know, this conversation uh, is interesting in that we have the researcher, scholar, and we have the practitioner, and, and how have you been able to implement some of the ideas and some of the critiques that you saw, uh, that you read about in, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in Marissa's book. Mm -hmm. So let me, is this one working? Yeah. Yay! Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna start with something else. Oh, 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 you deserve a bank like this. Let me hear you say, oh, 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 you deserve a bank like this. So we did go start a bank because we had a hunch that there was something terribly wrong in the banking system and how the other half banks illuminates uh, the many problems associated with what should be considered at least a quasi-public system. We also were well informed by Martin Luther King in one of the last speeches he made, exhorting us to take control of our economic power so that the legal and political rights so hard fought and won would have meaning. And it turns out, that's where we're stuck. We are stuck on a shortage of economic power. So venturing into the banking system was super important because that's where most of us have the opportunity to exert any kind of economic power. We think of banking as the original and most powerful form of crowdfunding, not that a specific deposit funds a specific loan because there's something complex called the fractional reserve system, but all deposits fund a lending practice. We pool our idle cash, we call them deposits, we put, give them to intermediaries called banks to finance the world in which we actually wish to live. And both sides of banking are important. As Marissa was saying, there's the access to our own money that has to be on the basis of fairness without high punitive costs. And then there's what, it, what is done with our deposits, what kind of lending practice is financed with our deposits. And that's super important too because we can take on pretty much for granted that most of us don't want our deposits funding fossil fuels, private prisons, or payday lending, but that's what it's been funding. So we started a bank to be an actor in the system who could understand the insights of what it really is like to be in the banking system, and we got our hats handed to us right off the bat because it turns out it's not good enough to be a good bank in a bad system. The whole thing has to be changed. So our mission now is to change the banking system for good. We did it by establishing a triple bottom line bank called Beneficial State Bank that's now a billion dollars in assets, 17 branch offices, 250 people. Those sound like big numbers to me. They are error terms in the banking system where two of our banks now are approaching two and a half trillion dollars in assets. And remember the Veterans Administration is 70 billion dollars in assets. It is impossible to manage something that's that big, and it's not actually serving us the way the banking system was meant to. With all due respect to the good people who work in the large money center banks, they are not lending to Main Street anymore. They are not even lending to business anymore. They are largely hedge funds and private equity firms using depositors' money. So in our bank, we insist that all our money stays in the real economy. Uh, we are owned by a nonprofit. 75% of our lending has to be in the new economy that's racially and gender dressed, just, fully inclusive, uh, environmentally sustainable. And you can find out anything you want to about our practices, including that we pay 150% of living wage, fully benefited to all of our workers, because that's super important in the banking system right now, too. Capital's beating up on labor, it's been doing it for centuries, and it's got to stop. Yeah, thank you very much. And
And Kat, I've seen a few of your YouTube interviews, and I noticed that you almost always start off singing. So just wondering <laughs> if maybe you could explain. Uh, what the heck? Yeah, yeah. Well, what is the reasoning behind that? <laughs> uh, I think what we're trying to suggest is it's time for new leadership in the banking sector. Uh, those banks who want to be hedge funds, fine. But we should take our $13 trillion of deposits back and give it to civil rights leadership who's willing to run a public system in it to advantage the public. Before I change the subject, I just want to ask if, if, if Marissa has anything to add to what was put forward. Um, yes, I mean, Kat's absolutely right about this. Uh, you know, billions is not how the banking sector measures assets. It's in the trillions, and those numbers mean nothing to me. You know, I mean, but, but it's really, um, it is really sort of, factors of scale, um, JP Morgan versus sort of the, the banks that are trying to do good. And so this is why what Kat said is super important is you can make change at the local level and we absolutely all should be 100% engaged in that, but we also have to push for changes in the system because it's not just, it's not even just about the, the banks being hedge funds. It's not just about the deposits. There is actually money from the Federal Reserve that is being disseminated through these banks. That's public money. It is being created, printed. I mean, we have to get to what is money, right? Money is a socially constructed good. We all decide that, the, that we're going to accept dollar bills and the world, uh, the dollar is now the world's currency and the Fed is able to print it. The Treasury is able to get investors in money, right? So money is a socially constructed paradigm of value, okay? It is not real. It's not gold in some mountain, right, as the Bitcoin people would have it. It is not, um, there's not a finite means of it, okay? We, you know, there are obviously limits to how much money you can print, inflation, et cetera, et cetera, but we're not near inflation. So I think really getting at the core of that and study, for those of us who are activists and progressive, to really start to consider finance and money as a point of progressive activism because we have left it to Wall Street and it's, it's complicated. But I actually, I got radicalized as a Wall Street lawyer seeing the Federal Reserve create money to bail out the banks. Mm -hmm. um, it went against everything I had learned in Econ 101 and in law school and, and, and everything that you know about economics is not true, right? Money and, and, um, and credit is public, okay? And public is us. Um, so I think that's the system-wide analysis is, is something that I, I would love for the left um, to focus on because I think it has been the domain of technocrats and sort of right-wing uh, economists. And there are these burgeoning sort of heterodox movements in the academy, but I think th th there needs to be some public discussion as well. Great. Thank you. And so I want to touch on your more recent book, uh, The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. I just wonder if you can briefly share how you see contemporary banking contributing to this ongoing racial wealth divide we've been talking a lot about at the conference, and we're all aware that the country is not on a path to, uh, to broach. Uh, you know, how, what do you see banking's role in that? Um, yeah, so... Uh I guess the second book is, is a story of how the racial wealth gap was created and how government credit you know, mechanisms created white wealth and prohibited the accumulation of black wealth. Um, and the, the way that this was done was you know, not just you know, uh, the, the refusal to give 40 acres and a mule, um, the creation of the Freedman Savings Bank that was in lieu of the land that was rightfully owed to the freedmen, um, they got this savings bank. Right, so we've used banks as this decoy. And then, you know, there's several sort of points of um, policy where the federal government, instead of actually reforming, um, which would have cost money, offered uh, capitalism and used capitalism as a weapon against demands for justice. And uh, this happens in the post-civil rights movement after everyone sort of loses interest in civil rights. Uh, Nixon um, starts this black capitalism framework, which was his economic agenda um, for, uh, the, in response to the civil rights movement. And what it was essentially was treasury dollars to black banks. And uh, it, it just seemed so, like, who could oppose, who would oppose black capitalism, right? It seemed like a really good device. Same with the Freedmen's Bank. And what I try to show is um, 
that they were a sort of, it was a Trojan horse, right? Um, what was hidden inside is no forward momentum on the things that we really should have been focused on, which is economic justice, which is capital. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so I think what, you know, the ways of the banking, I, I actually want to put the banks aside. I think banks are, banks are like water. I don't, I don't care about banks and their bad behavior. I mean, we should all care about it. I'm, I'm sort of looking at federal policy and looking at how federal policy funnels money to certain groups and not to other groups, right? So um, New Deal is, is one example, right? Creates intergenerational white wealth um, through these, these mortgage um, credit. Every one of us, uh, you know, uh, not, not me, but yeah, I'm an immigrant, but um, you know, every one of us has either got the, the, your granddad either got an FHA mortgage and a GI loan, or he didn't, right? And, and that determines the, the neighborhoods that you live in, the schools that you go to, whether you go to college or not, your income, all of that tracks to those federal policies that were essentially race-based. Nothing else, really. I mean, race was the primary mechanism by which we decided who would get a mortgage and who would not. Um, so, so these are the, and banks were complicit. Banks were just giving the money that the Federal Reserve or, and, the, and the FHA was, gave them for free, essentially, right? These were low risk, in fact, no risk mortgages. I, I, I talk in my bank, you probably all know this, the 363 banking, 3% 3 on deposits, 6% on loans. You're on the golf course by 3 p.m. It was just, <laughs> it was easy, boring banking because there was no risk. Because the Federal Reserve, the FHA was insuring your loans, the FDIC was insuring your deposits, and interest rates were capped. You were making no decisions. So the banks weren't an intermediary in the way that they were actually doing something. They were just a sort of vehicle through which this financing um, was creating a, a race-based uh, economy. Interesting. Your, your uh, kind of critiques of banks not being necessarily, you know, the people out there doing something, I mean, something intentionally wrong, but it was part of a larger system, reminds me of some of the more radical critiques I have heard of policing and police brutality. It's not constantly getting new police. It's that actually we set up a system for police to over-police certain communities and abuse certain people. So I'm just wondering on a more practical level, like what, f on, on a, yeah, on a more day-to-day -day level, like what focus is there at Beneficial State Bank to address the racial wealth mm -hmm. divide? Like how are you as a CDFI able to engage these issues? Yep. So first we acknowledge the origins of this country in slavery, native genocide, less than personhood for women, and uh, persecution of immigrants, refugees, the list goes on and on, that the American economy has been dependent upon structural racism for a long time and still is. And there are many factors along the way, well outside of the banking system, well beyond our control, that pretty much determine that black deposits are going to fund white loans. That's what's been happening for a long time, whether you start in the... GI Bill and uh, mortgage preferences, redlining, which was a cabal between the banks and the real estate industry and the federal government. And then you go into imminent domain and redevelopment, which uh, displaced and gentrified many neighborhoods. Uh, our current day opportunity to not harm is to guardrail opportunity zone finance before it follows suit to every other program that displaced and gentrified and visited horrible things on poor communities. Um, so we have to be aware of all these things even while we're trying to be a good bank and change the banking system for good. So the way that, that the bank was set up was to give it alignment in the public interest. We care deeply about governance models that uh, are uh, obliged to multiple stakeholder models. Maximization is not what we're after. We're out after optimization for all our stakeholder groups, which include our customers, our colleagues, the communities in which we work, the planet upon which we all depend, and the public interest at large, because there's an endemic public benefit to banking that should be had as well. Then uh, we insist that mission is at the heart of every product and, or service, such that a person or an organization is healthier the day after they took it than they were the day before. We have massive prevalence of predatory products in the banking system that absolutely debilitate uh, people and organizations and those have to go. Then that lending practice has to be very assiduous. 75% in the new economy, 25% not doing harm. Our corporate practices, you should get to know everything you want to know about a bank before you bank there. 
You should also get to know about their advocacy policies because a lot of times they're advocating against the public interest quite explicitly, and then transparency at large. Of course, every bank needs to be safe and sound, but there are just a few ways we can change the banking system. The one that affects most people in the room is by choosing your bank in alignment with your values. And even if you can't move for some reason, threaten to move. Then we can insist that our regulators and our regulations start embodying more of the public interest. I would float out that one day soon, we need to consider who is eligible for FDIC insurance. FDIC insurance is a self-insuring pool that's deeply enabled by the American taxpayer. We saw that in the Great Recession. When the fund is threatened or is going to run out of money, the taxpayer covers all that. So why would we let any institution that's accelerating risk in the system and behaving in risky ways themselves have that insurance? I would suggest that we have to think soon about threatening to with, withhold that and returning the $13 trillion of deposits in the American economy alone back to the purposes for which we all put it there in the first place. Um, we also, of course, know about um, that we need to offer alternatives to predatory products. You've, uh, if you've read Marissa's book, uh, payday lending, auto title loans, uh, overdraft products, there are all sorts of ways that banks can really harm uh, consumers. And so our bank tries to offer alternatives to that, a high road, fair uh, consumer loan uh, and credit card. Auto loans, we do high road auto loans. Auto loans probably rip people off more than any other product. And yet everybody needs a car to get to work or pick up their kids in most communities until we get mass transit. So we have to work at the firm level. We have to work in our communities, but we definitely have to change the system of banking because nothing less will suffice. And let me ask, you know, do you find, because, you know, with your bank, and again, your, you, how, many, um, how many actual banks do you have? Throughout, so you're in Washington, or no, Washington, California, and Oregon. In Oregon. So we grew one bank fast and bought four others. We have 17 branch offices. That's still pretty little, but we're a David amidst the Goliaths. We actually have the ability to have a lot more influence, and we think deeply about economic paradigm reform. So, for instance, in addition to uh, co coalescing with other movements to move your money, which is a consumer mass movement and working with regulators to see how we could re-regulate. We are very staunch supporters of CRA and beneficial CRA reform. CRA should ask more of our banks, not less. For instance, you shouldn't get credit for investing in a low-income community if it's a payday shop just because of the census tract. Hmm. There are many things like that that just have to go. Uh, we are a CDFI bank ourselves, and honestly, I think one day all banks should have to be CDFI banks. The hardest thing to meet as a CDFI bank is 60% of your loans by units and dollars have to land in low to moderate income census tracts. Why shouldn't that be every bank? That would solve some of the access to credit problems right, right away. But one thing I want to suggest that's fantastical, but you are participating in many network effects right now. You know the big ones. Amazon, Facebook, Google, Netflix, et cetera. But banks are a network effect as well. And we should use our people power to demand an equity share in every network in which we participate. Not just the ones that steal our data. We are participating. Amazon is nothing without shoppers. Facebook is nothing without sharers. Google is nothing without queries. So if we got a micro share every time we participated in, in these networks, we would change the governance of them. We would break up these concentrations of power that are changing our political roles, and we would never allow Cambridge Analytica onto a network that we owned. You know, I, and what I think is so exciting about both, both of you is that you both have so many solutions, or you know, be, promising practices, best practices to address these issues. And so let me, let me th put forward to both of you, I mean, I've noticed that today I think there's more conversations about actual policy solutions and practices to address racial wealth inequality in particular and economic inequality in general than I've heard of in a long time. And I know you were on the Hill earlier today uh, talking to various people. So I just want to throw out to both of you, what do you see? First, we'll start big and then we'll get more small and, uh, and local. Uh, you know, what do you see as big policy solutions being put forward that we think can make a serious dent in the, ec in the growing economic insecurity that so many Americans are facing? 
Um, I mean, I think there's a hunger now for um, progressive economic reform. I think it's, uh, you know, sort of neoliberalism failed uh, catastrophically in 2008 and you know this this idea that banks were going to police themselves and that there would be this market discipline um, we saw how the market lost its nerve and the government did step in to bail out and that's just how it is that that's how it will be next time too because that's the nature of banking they're operating using other people's money um, they're operating on the precipice of disaster and so the government's is always going to bail out banks. So anyone who tells you no more bailouts is lying, um, because they don't or, or they don't understand how banks work. And so, so in the sort of wake of that, I think it's it's a belated or late term sort of coming to terms with okay, well if we're going to bail out, if if the federal government and the taxpayer is at the end of the day, responsible for what happens to the banks, how do we want them to work? Um, and specifically, do we want them to not, you know, actively screw their customers, right? Um, I mean, you have, you know, banks like Wells Fargo, who are just, sorry if there's someone from Wells Fargo here, but, you know, the culture of Wells Fargo has been fraudulent, you know, and so there are these, um, there, you know, and, and, and that's just one that, that there, there's actually records for. I mean, you know, at, at most of the top banks, there is also a culture of, you know, the, the Goldman Sachs famously eating their customers' faces. And, 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 you know, these banks are not working for their customers. They're working for somebody. So, the, the, so now I think people are saying, okay, well, how do we want to govern the banking system? So what are the specific policy ideas? I mean, the CFPB, you talked about auto lending. You know, you look at the, the, the push and pull of the CFPB, and this is sort of a microcosm of, of politics, right? Auto lending is one of the most predatory, and it was exempt from the CFPB mm -hmm. governance. Why? Because the lobbies demanded it, right? And so you have um, these, these places where, and the public got the CFPB, we got that, but with, with some caveats. And right now you've got a CFPB head that is absolutely you know, against the mission of the CFPB. So, so I think there is, there is a lot of you know, foxes guarding hen houses right now, but, but these <laughs> things do change. And in the meantime, we can be putting forward these policies. So I think, you know, just brass tacks, I think there's housing stuff. Um, you know, I, I worked with Warren to beef up the CRA and do some of the reforms that you were saying. Put money, capital, in some of these po formerly redlined areas. I think that's huge. Um, I talk about postal banking, public banking. So Kat talked about how we need to give an option to, um, as opposed to payday lenders. Um, because some people, you know, the remedy to payday lending, a lot of, People say, okay, well, financial education, or you know, don't do that, right? Um, and and the and and so, but what, but what if you need five hundred dollars, right? You and and people need money, right, um, to to survive. And so, if your only option is a payday lender, that is the rational, good decision, right? And so. To, to, to shame someone for taking out a high interest loan because they just don't understand is, is, is rich people not understanding what poverty is like, right? Um, and so, so, so I think, you know, finding options, right? And, and, and saying, look, instead of this, do that. And the that is not available except for in places where Cat's <laughs> bank is functioning. There are some other grassroots organizations, but this is where public banking comes in, right? Um, start a public bank, a public fund. These are not losing loans. I mean, look at, looking at the payday lending model, if you look at it closely, they don't do any underwriting, okay? Everyone pays the same high interest for the same loan, okay? It's, it's, it's a profit model. They're paying for overhead, they're paying for that, but they measure default. The way they measure default is not on whether they get the principal back. They measure default if you miss a payment. So they beef up their default rates, but that's not default, right? Default is if you don't pay the principal. And so these are not losing loans. People are good for the money. We just have to figure out a sustainable way um, to lend them. And so there's a lot to be done here. So whether it's public banking, and I would, I think that's the easiest way, right? If the post office exists in every every zip code um, where there aren't nonprofits and there aren't banks, uh, so that's one way. Uh, state public banks, city public banks, just providing these loans and understanding uh, poverty, I think, is huge. I think we we mythologize, um, we we sort of pathologize uh, what wealth and poverty is, and I think those are we have to overcome those myths in order to really help. Um, poverty is not a uh, a flaw, it is not, uh, it, it is a social system, we create that. 
And as we go to CAD, I just want to remind people to, uh, if you have any questions, please write them down. We're going to start taking questions from the audience. Raise your hand. And I don't see the runners, but I'm assuming they're invisibly around somewhere. And someone should just appear and take your uh, question if you have it. But mm -hmm. let me also yeah, throw to you, I mean, what sure. large national policy um, solutions, ideas you see out there that you think could be effective mm -hmm. and be helpful for the work that you're already doing on the ground? Right. Um, and I totally agree. Poverty is a societally imposed condition. It doesn't occur naturally. So the fact that we have so much of it, in California, 50% of our children are now growing up in poverty. And one in three Americans work full time but meet the federal definition of poverty, and that's supposed to be one in two by 2020. So poverty is an assault on society that matters to all of us, um, and banking products are a big driver of it. It sounds crazy to say, but the free checking accounts at Washington Mutual actually cost everyone who took a free account $500 in fees a year. So we need to legislate out with policy some of the worst practices and get busy providing those alternatives, alternatives to payday lending, alternatives to auto uh, title lending and things like that. Um, what we're doing in the state of California, we're a very mouthy bank, as you can tell, very political bank. So we have uh, partnered with the head of the banking committee to propose a state level CFPB, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, because the federal one has been eviscerated, is not serving its original intent, which was a very good and high-minded intent. Um, we think we can do at the state level uh, in a large uh, 40 million people in California, headquarters of one of the biggest banks in America that has had the worst headlines. So we think we can get some work done on a state level and inspire other states to set, stand up CFPB so we could have a federation of consumer protection agencies throughout the country. Um, some of the rulemaking that the CFPB was re had put in place and was ready to put in place, we could just simply pick up, get it done at the state level until we can get back into the Fed. The, we are also very uh, supportive of public banks uh, in California, we think we have the opportunity to have a host of divisional banks at the municipal level that would roll up to a state level bank. And then once again, encourage other states to establish a public bank so we can have a federation of public banks and c create a money supply, money creation process if we're locked out uh, either through the Fed or if we're locked out of the Fed on our own. Um, we have a big problem in California because cannabis is an all cash industry so far and cash industries invite money laundering. It's no fault of cannabis, it just is where the money launderers go. So we also need to come up with a, a solution to that at the state level. Uh, and then finally, I'm just a really big fan of plat work, platform cooperatives. I think we need to change the uh, global economy into a series of uh, cooperatively owned industries because that's where we are, we're globally connected but locally uh, reputationally uh, grounded. And, and let me just step back for a second because, you know, I think, again, your analysis, both of your analysis is that it's not necessarily that banking is leading the wrong, it's that there is a wrong in the economy and banking is part of that. So I want to ask you for even, you know, policy ideas of, you know, that are outside of banks in particular that are needed to address the inequality. Because I don't think it's just through reforms in banking that we're going to address the, the deep economic inequality, the deep wealth inequality that exists in this country. Um, I think we need to consider reparations. Um, seriously, uh, capital, and it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to go um, back to slavery. We can do, you know, go back to the FHA if we need to be generationally focused, right? Um, there's a, many we, means of doing this. We just need to focus on it. Um, tax, taxing. I mean, it's simple, right? Um, nobody should be a billionaire. I mean, I, I, there is no reason why a living human needs a billion dollars. No reason. I mean, truly, what, what do you need to buy, right? Um, that, you, that a million dollars, like $10 million, I don't know. But what do you need a billion dollars for, okay? Um, and more. So, so I think taxing, I think breaking up these large companies, I mean, I think that is huge. We are, we are entering a new era of robber barons. And the fact that they're young and hip and like, you know, these like cool guys who drink Soylent and like, you know, work, like they're robber barons. They're just as bad as U.S. Steel, right? Mark Zuckerberg is the Rockefeller, right? He, he is, he controls too much 
of the economy. Jeff Bezos controls too much of the economy. And we have, we invented, the progressives invented ways of dealing with that, right? You break them up, right? You antitrust, right? Um, you tax, you, you force um, capital, and that's, and again, I mean, capitalism is a, is a hard word, but in order for capitalism to survive, you need competition, right? It is impossible to compete with Google, Facebook, Amazon, I can't remember the other ones, but there's like a big, there's like four or five of them that there, there's no comp competition. Even Amazon, you can be a small lender, a small vendor, and the second you cr um, pass through some profitability limit, Amazon will just cut you out and do it themselves. It's like Walmart, right? So, so these are not, this is not capitalism, right? This is monopoly power. Um, same with the banks. I mean, JP Morgan, well, look at the five banks that own 80% of the assets. Those are monopolies. Those are powerful interests that it's really difficult for small banks to fight. And so this is where the people come in and elect people that are going to break them down. That, 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 that's the only way at this point. And we are almost past the precipice of being able to fight that because once you get so powerful, and this was the, 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 you know, the big thing of the progressives, once you get so powerful, um, it's impossible to fight because they're, they're deeply in that sort of um, politics and, and the people can't, uh, fight that af after Can a certain I just point. Add yeah, couple of, no, agree with everything, and uh, I would say um, we need campaign finance reform. That I just don't know how else we're going to get corporations out of rulemaking. <laughs> Citizens United was the last of, I think, the 14th Amendment has been used something like 380 times to benefit a corporation and only 14 times to benefit a human being, which is just scandalous. So I, I don't see any way to get to a lot of these other reforms if we don't get corporations out of the rulemaking process. And I would say that that extends to Janice too, that we have to give workers m more ability to organize because these big platform network effects too are also completely undermining the workers' ability to negotiate. Well, let me, let me throw out two uh, questions from the audience there for Kat, and then we'll go back to Marissa. Um, how can banks like Beneficial support local businesses to resist displacement? That's mm. one question. And then the other question was, as a triple bottom line bank, how do you work towards a profitability, a profitability to satisfy investors and ensure safety and soundness for regulators? Mm -hmm. um, so great. Uh, the way we work against displacement and gentrification, which has been a hallmark of our uh, lifetime. We were born in 2007, so first we lived through the foreclosure crisis. We waited in and tried to incentivize the biggest banks to do mortgage modifications to stem the slide. Nobody would do that. They feared an asset reclassification, which was ripe for happening, it turned out. But they knew the bubble was there. So nobody would be the first mover, and we just saw massive foreclosures and displacement according to that. So we got very busy in the affordable housing lending markets. That's, uh, we have about a quarter of a million dollars in multifamily loans, most of which are either deed restricted affordable or practically affordable. We just have to increase the supply of affordable housing, especially in low income communities. We were big supporters of Prop 10, which sadly did not pass, but we need to restore the ability to enact rent control on a local basis. Rent control is the only prayer we have for mixed income housing, which is uh, actually supposed to be a hallmark of American living. Um, we also have a, we do small business lending in SBA and, and outside of that as well. We've just beefed it up. We have to get loan capital to uh, existing businesses. One of the things I'm worried about in the Opportunity Zone finance is that this massive wave of capital is going to come in and just wash out existing affordable housing, create a bunch of luxury housing, and, and actually give low-cost capital to businesses that compete with our existing small businesses in low-income communities. So we just have to get out there as fast as we can with as much loan capital as we can uh, to shore up the circular economy. But I totally believe what Marissa's second book was talking about is you can't ask structural racism and bad e uh, economic systems be changed one bank at a time. We're too small to do it. When we need the strength of a big balance sheet for capital, for li liquidity, and diversification. That's the network effect in banking. When we all move together, we can do it safely. If you ask us to move one at a time, it's really scary and hard for all the reasons that she talks about in her book. Well, and you know, related to that, there was a question. Um, 
about how black banks can help stem gentrification and displacement. And so I think it relates to that uh, challenge of individual banks changing the system, but let me just give you a second to respond. Yeah, I mean, um, black banks did not engage in subprime lending. Black banks didn't exploit the populations that they served. You know, so while I, I think we need large structural changes um, and that asking small banks to fix a problem that massive federal policy created is, is cynical and unfair, small banks and black banks and community-oriented banks at least don't do harm. Um, and they protect and they you know, do as much as they can. So, so I think, you know, as far as preventing gentrification, the problem with gentrification is you need capital in these spaces, right? You need capital, you need money, right? You can't do it through banking. And this is, this is unfortunately um, one of the misunderstood things of, of banking. And, and maybe I'm gonna make some people mad, but I read the book and if you disagree, write me, but the, the, the <laughs> you can't lend your way into capital. You need capital to make more capital. This is why JP Morgan keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and why community banks cannot compete, right? Unless you have structural reforms, money is going to go toward more money. Capital is going to go toward more capital. Okay, it's, it's like the centripetal pull of that system. And so to disrupt that, you need sort of government intervention. You need policies that reverse that tide. You need to either break down these big, big banks and big companies, or you need to infuse capital into those neighborhoods. So looking at gentrification, right? Once you have, let's say, an opportunity zone and money comes in, that money goes to the investors. It goes to the people who already have money. And once those big developments come in, and like, I saw it happen in Harlem. I grew up near Harlem, and I saw as soon as Starbucks comes in, as soon as Whole Foods goes in, the neighborhood has to go to the Bronx, Yonkers, Queens, right? You can't afford that once it gentrifies. Like looking at Brooklyn, right? So, so the, the way to disrupt that is to actually give people an ownership stake. Right? You have to own the land in order to benefit from gentrification. And how can you do that? You can't necessarily do it through bank loans unless, of course, someone is going to reduce the risk of lending. And so I, I am sanguine. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about putting all of our eggs, and again, I'm going to make people mad. I am, I am, I'm nervous about putting our eggs in CRA, CDFI basket. Definitely, we need to do that stuff, but we also need to look at the roots of these problems and, and tackle the root and not rely on banks. I don't really trust banks, except for the good ones. <laughs> I don't trust banks to fix it. Even if you give them a mandate, you see how they will do barely the minimum or go around it in some way, right? Banks want to make profits. That's just, that's their game, right? And so if you're going to tell a profit-oriented bank to, to serve the community, they're gonna do it, but they're gonna do it their way. And I, I just don't trust um, banks to do it. And so this is why I go with public banking. Someone's gotta be accountable um, to the public. And I, I would rather it be an elected official that we can vote out as opposed to a CEO. Another question from the audience is, is there's been no mention of credit unions. Are they helping mm. or hurting? So, uh, and also I forgot to answer, we have a return on equity hurdle of six to 10% because we do have to be sustainable. We have to make a profit in order to keep on doing business. At 6%, it's resilient. At t over 10%, we figure we're either gouging customers or underpaying our workers. So that w it's a disciplined profit-taking approach. Um, one thing that might help the banking system be more genuine in its approach to serving community would be to break it up so we had four simple rules of re-regulation. It was uh, limit the size of banks to something that ends in a billion, certainly not a trillion. Uh, reinstall the Volcker rule or Glass-Steagall so they, they can't trade in securities for their own account, which is way too speculative an activity to use deposits for. Um, keep a 10% tier one capital ratio. And I would add to that now, and I should have mentioned this before in policies, we should have counter cyclical capital requirements. So now in the heyday of banking, when money's cheap on Wall Street for banks, they should have to go layer in a massive new capital layer so that when the recession comes, which it's coming, they don't contract because that's how they meet their capital ratios. They contract. They pull all the lines, all the revolving lines of credit from the big businesses in town, which just absolutely starves the small businesses in towns. It's horrible to watch. 
So 10% capital requirements plus a countercyclical layer on top of that, and then let them fail. Every single bank that gets into trouble, let them fail. Don't bail them out. It's the only way you force the responsibility back onto the equity shareholders. <laughs> credit unions we love. Most banks hate credit unions because they're single taxed. That's fine with us because they have an accountability model. When they're well run, they're accountable to their members who are their stakeholders. They're not a concentration of power if they're truly accountable to their members. Um, and they are actually a cooperative model, which is what I would advocate for. Um, since you all invited me, I'm going to say what, I, what I'm going to say. Um, um, so I, I talk about credit unions. Um, I talk about credit unions in the book. I, I am not. I think credit unions way, have a way better reputation than they deserve. And part of it is because of their history. Their history is amazing. They're a progressive populist era response to these big banks. Um, at this point, the data reveals that they are not serving the populations that they're pretending to be serving. Um, they are not paying the taxes. Look, they're, they're better than JP Morgan. Like, if you're looking at the top five banks, like, Definitely, I mean, I, I am a credit union customer because I don't have a, a black bank in the area. I would be a black bank customer if I had one. But so, so definitely, if you want to personally bank at a credit union, if that makes you feel good, but they are not the answer to the things that, that we're talking about here. One, because they're doing the same type of lending and deposit taking than the big banks are. They are, once we got rid of the common bond in 1989, so credit unions, the, the idea was that they were like a microcredit lending circle, which I also don't, don't like, so sorry. But um, the, the idea here is that you're going to get a group of people disenfranchised from mainstream banking to pool their resources and collectively lift themselves out of poverty. That may have worked in 1910, but right now when money is all coming from the Federal Reserve that's printing money and paying JP Morgan $8 million a year on their reserves, that is not a model to be poverty, okay? So, so credit unions in 1910 had this common bond. So we're gonna lower the interest for lending because we all trust each other, because we all work together. There's like 30 of us. In 1989, the credit union lobby, which is powerful, okay? Um, the credit union lobby pushed to get rid of their common bond. So now anyone can join any credit union. So they're basically like a bank. They do have um, duties to their shareholders and banks don't, so you do get some, some derivative um, functions, but, but I'm, I'm not gonna stake my sort of, you know, uh, you know redeeming this, this, um, these institutions on credit unions, so. I'm, I'm almost scared to ask this next question. <laughs> <laughs> about, the question was posed by the audience. Uh, so where are the fintechs in this universe of lending challenges, good or bad? It was asked, and so I'm, I'm putting it out there. Cad, you want to start? Well. <laughs> we'll, let Mar we'll let Marissa finish. I, 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 yeah. I, know, I know where fintechs are going. Okay. Um, and I don't uh, support poorly run credit unions, I'll say that. But accountable ones, I think, are an option. Uh, we have to get banking right. We have to get the banking system right. It's going to kill us otherwise. Uh, fintechs are just one more way of doing banking, and they're not going to overcome the challenges of banking unless we address them head on. They, um, you know, they might bring some efficiency. They might bring, I mean, we work with fintechs, but honestly, a fintech needs a bank ultimately. They can't scale on hedge fund debt, 15% minimum. Uh, so they're going to look like an innovative maverick outsider for a time, and then they're gonna look for a bank or to become a bank. SoFi famously said, kill all the banks, and then a year later they were applying to become one. B because of the money creation process, that's what everybody's trying to get in on. So FinTech is sort of a very fancy wrapper on it. I do have some hope that, that responsible financial institutions would, could use FinTech to boost accountability if they use it right, uh, not to get into surveillance and you know, bad credit reporting and a bunch of other stuff. But it's, I, it's a bit of a distraction from the main thing, which is banking is quasi-public. We do it together. We ought to do it in favor of public interests. And before we go to Marissa, I also want to put forward a kind of a, a final question. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all the questions that were sent up, 
But one final question is uh, that I'd like both of you to address is, you know, how can like people in this room who are connected to community advocacy, advocacy groups, local institutions, how can they help advance the changes that we're saying, the massive changes that we're saying need to occur? What are, you know, best practices, ideas for them, uh, you know, going along with your critique? But let's also hear about the fintech. Oh, yeah, I'd love to talk about fintech. Um, so going, going back to those two elements of credit versus um, sort of financial transaction, both of those are public and both of those are bank monopolies, okay? So if a fintech company is going to give credit, they're going to charge market rate. So looking at these peer-to-peer -peer lending, and that's the only, I mean, fintech is massive. But you're, if you're lo looking at, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, they're just charging market rate. So they're not actually fixing anything. If you're looking at the financial transaction line, this is exactly where Kat is saying. They're actually not just needing to become banks. They are currently using banks to get access to that payment system. So every one of them, Square, PayPal, SoFi, they use this, they use a loophole called an ILC in Utah. There's two banks that are doing it. They're paying these banks to get access to this payment system. So they're not, not banks. They pretend like they're going to get rid of banks. And sometimes even their CEOs talk as if they're not using a bank. But if you dig down, they, they are actually accessing this, this um, f uh, payment system. The problem with fintech, fintech is fine. Right? Um, but you can't sort of throw a rock in Silicon Valley without someone saying like, oh, the, the problem, the, the, the reason, the, the, the solution to the unbanked is like M-Pesa, like in, you know, like mobile banking. Treasury, um, the Senate, it is so deeply ingrained there that FinTech is somehow going to fix the problem of the unbanked. It's not. Every, every FinTech provider currently, you need a bank account, right? So if you sign up for Venmo, if you sign up for pay, pay, PayPal, you're going to link up a bank account. Okay, so this is not fixing anything. It's making our, it makes my life much easier to use Venmo to pay my babysitter, right? Um, it is not the solution uh, to poverty. And I think the problem is, and, and I'm not against it, but the problem is when we rely on technology to fix these fundamental structural problems. Um, as far as what can people do, and I want to say, like, I, Kat and I are doing different things. I am an academic. I get to say stuff. I don't have to do anything. Like, I don't, I don't have to do anything, you know? Like, I'm actually not doing anything. I'm just writing stuff. So, so, so I think, you know, it's, it's, I can say, like, oh, we don't need credit unions, and that's, like, my role. But, but I think it's different for someone who's actually, like, doing stuff to say, like, credit unions are better than, than banks. And so I think, you know, just to, 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 to sort of uh, play down my role here, it's one thing for me to say, like, oh, we need structural change, but for people on the ground to actually, to, to go to your last question, what do, what do we do? I mean, there's a lot to be done. Um, there's a lot to be done. But also paying attention. For those in this room who understand finance and who have good politics, pay attention to what judges are appointed. You said something earlier about a state CFPB. One of the things that could kill that is preemption. So this, the OCC comes in and says, you know what? And this happened on the run-up to the, the financial crisis. Michigan, Georgia, North Carolina tried to protect their citizens. And some federal judge said, you know what? The OCC preempts. And therefore, your regs are no longer valid. So paying attention to who the judges are, are appointed and what their views are on those minor details that end up having huge impact um, nationwide. Okay, thank you. And, yeah, I have a last word. Um, so the, uh, our theory of change is not that we're somehow going to become the banking system. I already told you that we're a tiny little error term bank. You could lose our assets in the big bank's car in an afternoon. <laughs> but we, our theory of change is that we have something going for us, and it's people power. And so in a sense, we kind of get the banking system that we ask for, and we need to ask much harder for a good one. So uh, everybody can choose where they bank if they can bank. There's a huge uh, set of the population who can't bank at all. So we need to represent extra hard on their behalf to choose the best banks in the system. Our theory is that if banks act more in the public interest over time, they will win deposit, equity, and human capital. You start to see that in Dakota Access Pipeline protests in the first four weeks, $100 million fled the banks who had financed that pipeline as appropriate because they didn't want complicity with something that was 
uh, derogating native rights, screwing up a precious resource called water, and accelerating climate change. If we all took the care to only have our deposits associated with financial institutions that were executing on our values, the system would have to straighten up pretty darn quick. If we take that to equity capital as well, don't invest in a bank. Okay, a lot of us can't invest in banks anyway. But we have large national foundations that are invested in banks, and nobody's calling them to account on that. They should not be in banks that are undermining their programmatic goals. And then the last thing is human talent. I'm actually uh, a positive believer in the next gens that they really do want an integrated life. They, they see from my generation, the boomers, that you cannot clean up on Saturdays and in retirement what you screwed up from Monday to Friday. Not ever going to wag that dog. So we need to make sure that all these young, bright people, even if they go into the fintech door, they know that they won't lift a finger for a bank that's not observing the public interest and getting this world turned around to where we need it to be. Let's give another big round of applause for our speakers.